Thank you again for, for being here, and I'm going to introduce Nathan from OJB to come up and give you a presentation. Uh, my name is Nathan Elliott. I'm a principal with OJB Landscape Architecture, and I am incredibly fortunate. I get to travel across the country working with cities uh, like yours to help design urban parks. Um, I'm just one person involved in this. There are a whole host of other people, um, committed uh, governmental entities, nonprofits. The consultant team is very large. This project takes will take a lot of effort from a lot of people to make this happen. Uh, I just want to recognize that there's a lot of folks working in the background doing technical studies uh, while we get to talk up here and show the fun stuff. So, whoops, wrong way. Um, so what we're gonna do is a brief presentation. Again, our firm, uh, we are landscape architects and planners, and we're really focused on trying to guide through uh, people, place, and the environment, uh, good foundations for our practice, and they're guiding all the decisions that we're trying to make as we work on this project. Um, we've designed a number of significant public open spaces across the US. Um, most recently, uh, the, down, the riverfront in uh, downtown Omaha, Nebraska, not far from here. And then we've also worked on Clyde Warren Park, which is another freeway cap park project, as well as many others. What we really try to do is take the lessons from each one of these projects we've been building over the last 15 years and bring the, the best and the brightest forward with every time and continue to stay involved. Um, so what we're gonna bring to, to Kansas City for the South Loop uh, is the kind of the, the latest thinking in urban park design. So as part of that, uh, we always try to learn about the city. We are of course working with um, some leading consultants and we have some great clients here that tell us about, we also try to, to figure out some of these things for ourselves. We've been looking um, at the history, trying to understand what the fabric of, what the fabric of Kansas City was like before. Um, we're also trying to look just, you know, what was the city like? And these are some interesting photos we found. A lot of these uh, looking particularly at, uh, at 15th Street, which is basically what used to be, uh, what is now Truman Road, excuse me. Uh, one of the really interesting moments, we kind of figured this out. This is that bluff that the Lowe's Hotel is on. So um, just trying to figure out, you know, what is the sense of place for Kansas City and how can we make this a place that's authentically yours? Um, we're not there yet. This is part of this process. And again, we're here to listen today and get some more feedback um, based on the things we heard the last time. So, um, I, you guys know your city, um, but we have been learning a little bit more about it, trying to figure out what, what makes it tick and uh, what makes how can we bring that out. One of the things we've been really interested in is how we can bring uh, the natural landscapes of this part of the country, of uh, our surrounding Kansas City and North Missouri here, to, um, to look at that. So, um, there's the alluvial floodplain, which is maybe not as dominant, but really the, um, the Lost Prairies and some of the Osage Plains and the Osage Forest. Just try to, how can we bring this and make this feel like it's not just planted with things that aren't from here. Um, there's a lot of research we did here. It was great to see in the first public meeting, there was a lot of feedback um, about native plants and their value. So people in the community are aware, which is great. Um, we want to bring that forward and make that a big part of the project. Um, I'm going to try to zip through. Again, I want to keep this really brief because what we want to do is get into the back, but I'm going to just talk to you guys about some of the things that we've been looking at. When we're trying to consider the place of this park in the city, so um, you've probably heard about the concept of the 15-minute city. Um, it's the idea that you have all these services kind of immediately surrounding you, uh, and it's just it's good urbanism. And so this park is really well connected. Of course, we've got downtown to north, we're on the bridge of the crossroads, but also connected to the neighborhoods on the, on the east and the west. Uh, we've been looking at other things, just neighborhood identity. Uh, transit's a big one. You guys have a great success with the streetcar already existing in, the, in, in and around the park, which is amazing. And we did look at the tree canopy. And one thing we heard a lot about last time was the kind of people's desire for this to be a green space. Both downtown and the crossroads are a little thin on trees and greenery in general. So one thing we know that's really important is making sure that this is gonna be kind of a lush landscape and you're going to be able to you know, come to it and feel like you're away from the city. Uh, we're also trying to understand a bunch of other things that are maybe a little arcane, um, you know, land use, zoning. Um, there are a couple of things that are really important. This is the study area. So really the park we're studying here is to look um, from Truman to Truman, all the way from Grand up the bridge to the edge of the convention center on Wyandotte. Part of our study, uh, you probably saw some boards about the NEPA process at the, at the beginning. Um, because of the, the things we're looking at about the tunnel, we're also studying these areas under the convention center. But the park focus is really this zone here on the right. Um, one of the really 
interesting uh, elements of this project. One thinks it'll be a challenge and a design opportunity is how much topography you have here. So there's a really big grade change. Without getting into too much consultant technical speak, you have about four, 30 to 40 feet that transitions from the upper level of Wyandotte down to Baltimore. There's then about another 10 or 12 feet as you step down to Maine, and then you go down again another 10 feet, and then back up again at Grand. So uh, one of the things we're really concerned about is making sure that these parks are universally accessible, that anybody no matter what their physical ability, um, can get to the, get around the park, navigate it easily, know where to go. Um, th that's all possible with what we know about the physical grading. It will take a little bit of effort, um, but it's also you know this opportunity to make a promontory or kind of a, an overlook from the area over wine. It's also a really cool opportunity that you wouldn't have anywhere else. So um, trying to th with all these things, trying to take these challenges and turn them into fun solutions. Uh, we're also been looking, one of the things we heard a lot about is parking. Um, obviously, this is a small urban park. It's only about five acres. Uh, we would not actually park something inside the park just because of how, how tight the conditions are. But we do know that there's parking around it. And these are all things that can continue to change as the fabric of the city changes around it. You guys also have light rail. There's bus. There's more cycling connections. So we're hoping also that the park and spurs um, a, a bigger push for multimodal transit options. So I'm um, just looking at these pieces. Um, one of the things you'll notice is it's, it's a little, it's just shy of five acres in totality when you start counting these right-of-ways and all these other pieces. But each one of these blocks is a little small. Um, and what we, one of the things we'll be asked about today, if you've already, um, some of you folks already, I think, filled out some surveys, you maybe saw the boards. One of the things we're trying to talk about is the big picture of how this park might be organized and how could we capture to make these open spaces more impactful. Um, just a couple of the things that we are looking at, obviously the grading, you can see some numbers here about these grade changes. Uh, we do know that you've got bike lanes on Grand. Uh, there's a bit of a low point. We've heard a lot about this intersection at Walnut, that that area floods, that there's a couple of things we need to do to solve a technical problem. It's, um, it's not like a very glitzy or glamorous thing, but when we come in here and we build something that's significant, we want to make sure that we solve the fundamental issues that make this area of the city work. Um, we know there's a couple of other constraints and utilities, but just doing that legwork got us to public workshop number one. This was about a month ago. Shout out to you guys, you, fe you featured. Uh, we had about a little over 200 people in person. Um, we got some really great feedback, uh, all kinds of different things that we heard from the public. And again, there was voting on, I guess it was about 20 of these program elements. Um, so really, this was an idea of what could, the, what could go in the park? What could it possibly be? So we also did ask the question, what should this project be for Kansas City? And so it was really interesting. Um, there was less focus on it being a place for civic and cultural events. You guys, obviously, you have some of those spaces further south. Um, and less about being a refuge in a city, tracked okay, but really is about being a community amenity. And I think that's really um, how we've tried to frame all these discussions. How can we make this a big value add for the community? How can we make a space that appeals to everybody in Kansas City? And we're not there. Your input tonight, again, is a really important part of how we figure that out. So uh, I'm not going to read every one of these to you. You guys can all read it out lo a lot faster than I can say it. Um, but there were, I think, um, some interesting takeaways. I think one thing was that, um, you know, that event lawn, which wasn't events and activities, which scored lower in person, really came out um, from the middle of the pack and ended up being very high. So while it's maybe not the place for the entire city, it's a place where, other, where you do want to come together with people and, and come together and gather. Um, you know, the one thing we heard a lot, and this isn't really surprising given, you know, the the tree counts and things we see as we just walk around downtown is that shady courts and some of that passive space are really important. You also thought park restrooms are a really big deal. So um, some of these other things are pretty consistent with what we see in a lot of other places, food trucks, having a place to get something to eat. Um, so we've taken this feedback as well as listening to some of your comments. We got a lot of comments, several hundred. These are just um, some of the, the select ones. These are some of the ones we heard uh, in person. And then we also got uh, a whole different set of, uh, of ones in the online survey. So we're trying to take as much of this feedback as we can. There were a lot of uh, really great questions and suggestions. Um, so what we've done is we've come together with two fundamental ideas, and they're guided by a few principles. First is that we have a series of site constraints that we must honor and live by. Um, one is that, uh, particularly as you're on the west side by Wyandotte and the convention center, you have all the grading and the retaining walls. It gets very tall there. We have to be, you know, work with the structure that's existing and be safe. Um, we also have some existing utilities that have to be, uh, to be, we have to be mindful of. There's a major transformer that serves the, uh, the metro line. Uh, 
uh, that the streetcar is powered by. So um, that is a kind of a, a sacred object. We can't really, you can't disrupt that. Um, there's also an existing utility bridge that goes across that carries a really important fiber duct. So there's a big telecommunications stuck that runs to their project. So um, some of those things, of course, um, we want to be uh, good stewards of the, the money that would go towards this project. So being thoughtful about how we treat these existing conditions and respond to them. There's also the retaining walls. And there's, like I said, um, HNTB and the bridge and tunnel engineers are doing a ton of work to figure out the best solutions. And we're working through that. And that'll be part of that process and the outcomes you'll see later this summer when we come back with additional concepts. So we're also thinking about sustainability. Um, we, to, in the interest of brevity, we have been looking at a series of analyses about solar exposure and seasonal wind patterns in terms of how we want to site things. So we do know that um, there's, whoops, wrong way. Uh, we do know that there's some winter winds in the north that come in that are pretty tough. In particular, they create a bit of a wind tunnel with the, the power and light building. So we know that having some masses that screen these on the north side is going to be really important. Um, we have a little limited space of actual terra firma, like we have real dirt that's not going to be part of the cap structure, and we know that that may be necessary to help us solve some of the stormwater management problems that, that we've learned about on the project. Um, we also want to make sure that we're mindful of the solar exposure. So really, this tower on the corner results in the winter time that you get a very shady condition here in this upper left, uh, kind of this Y and dot block. Um, it gets a little bit better as you get into the next block, and then you get really good sun in this eastern edge. The other thing we're also really conscientious of is adjacent to the freeway, we want to have both a noise and pollution barrier. So we looked at, we've done a lot of um, investigation into a particulate matter. We want to make sure that we're able to, um, for people that are using the park, that we give them as much of a buffer from the freeway as we can. So you'll see these elements. They're going to be consistent throughout the project, but if you look carefully at the schemes, you'll see how these things are applied to the concepts. We also are trying to think, just from a big picture standpoint, of how we bring these landscape characters into the into the site. Um, that upland forest, it's uh, maybe not exactly like Mother Nature created, but there's an opportunity conceptually to link that upper block. It'll be a little shadier, also create maybe that refuge and that respite that we were hearing about and are interested in bringing to the project. And then also kind of balancing, um, based on the solar exposure, how these other landscape forms might bring, might uh, these landscape types might come into the park. So there's two ideas that we're talking about today. There's a western superblock and an eastern superblock. So in this idea, um, the, big, the big idea is to close Baltimore to create a larger landscape zone on the west from Maine to Wyandotte that transitions from this upper level down. Uh, it includes a smaller event space here, a little bit more kind of a natural pavilion and amphitheater space, overlooked by a large hill and a berm, again, trying to take advantage of that topography that we were talking about. Um, there's a little bit of food and beverage uh, on this sort of larger western block. And then you have a big kind of prairie demonstration landscape and garden that you can escape to. This main walnut block is then the major feature here is play. It also has a smaller dog run to help deal with some of the, the issues that we've seen. We know that there's a lot of dog users both in, the, in two and three light and also some in the other surrounding residential. Um, and then we also have in this eastern edge, just because of its adjacency to uh, power and light, it makes a lot of sense for all the events and the activities to be that, that kind of high density activity and programming to be loaded on the eastern side. Uh, and this also has a smaller, we basically split the food and beverage opportunities into two different ways. Uh, restrooms in the children's area and then a kind of a, a more feature pavilion in that zone. So um, again, just the way that we thought about organizing this is that this upper section here is really more that kind of refuge landscape. You, know, you get away, take a nice stroll, um, that you really have more of this kind of family zone that bridges between those two spaces. And then on the eastern end, it's more community oriented. So um, just a quick run through these diagrams and how we think these things might be organized. You know, this would have, there's, um, there's a pavilion, whoops, I don't know how to use a, a slideshow advancer, here we go. There's a pavilion here on this edge. There's a 4,000 square foot food hall here. There's bathrooms that serve both the park and the children's area. And there's a food hall and a pavilion. And we think there's some engagement. There's a lot of interest in interactive public art. Uh, so just as an idea that those would maybe cap the projects and serve as ways to bring people into the edges. 
Um, just again, talking about the program, that there's a, a large terrace. We know that if you're coming from the convention center, it's probably not reasonable that you're going to walk all the way down to the far end of the park. But we want to have an opportunity where there's some flex space you could gather up here. So this could be anything from, you know, 500 people to 1,500. There's also kind of a similar scaled space in this amphitheater. And then this lawn is a little bit smaller. This is only about a 10,000 square foot lawn, but it's expanded by having this, this bluff, this kind of built up berm area on the end. Um, the play area is about 16,000 square feet. It's less than half an acre, but um, used creatively that could make a really imaginative and fun children's environment. And then we've got a smaller, this is kind of the larger lawn here. Um, and this is that lawn for kind of 1,500 to maybe 4,000 people if you really get cozy with your neighbors and make some friends, and that's kind of anchored by a community plaza and the pavilion. Uh, we really, again, we talked a lot about circulation, just the idea that everything is really well connected. We have thought about how do we get people up from this upper layer and wind them down? How do you have um, not just a transmission space, but those become people places as well, places to gather, places to get away from the hustle and bustle, or to just, if you're at the, you know, if you're just at the convention center coming down, you can hang out there for a few minutes for going back inside. Uh, finally, again, we're thinking about how these ecology and, uh, and uh, stormwater elements, hydrology, are, are integrated into the project. That's going to be consistent just in, in keeping with sustainable principles. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these enlarged areas just to give you an idea. So this, again, public art and some sort of gathering space at the upper level. There's a series of passive stroll gardens. Uh, and this idea, we're showing kind of smaller configurations where they're broken out. And they lead to this lower level amphitheater. This, this pavilion could be just a shady spot to hang out at. It could also double for smaller performances and events. And then it shares with this other lawn space. So it can kind of do, do, it can do double duty looking for a smaller group to this edge, less formal events. And it could also do something that's a little bit more structured. And the next block, that lawn continues and then continues to this kind of elevated lawn that's kind of built up over everything else. This is the smaller of the, the park cafe options, but still would have a few choices, some different vendor variety. And then there's groves. So there's, again, that kind of flady, shady, flexible courts along the perimeter. Going to the south to the children's area, the next block. Um, again, a little bit of a buffer away from the streetcar. So the, the play area really enters off of this edge. Uh, and then this is, again, that's that kind of medium 16,000 square foot. The, the restrooms would serve both the park and the children's area, so you don't have to leave. You don't have to pack all the kids in the stroller up and leave the playground uh, if, you, if some, one of the kids has to go to the restroom. Um, and then this kind of dog park here in this northern zone. And then and the final block, um, this is, again, that 15,000 square foot lawn. This is that kind of smaller 4,000 square foot food and beverage opportunity with a grove on the south so you can have uh, kind of food trucks pull up and you can hang out here and, you know, you can grab something from the, um, from the, the, the restaurant and Chris could get something for the food truck and we can still hang out in the park and enjoy a beautiful day outside. Uh, so I'm going to give this a go. We'll see if it just starts playing. It's always better. Uh, even design professionals have a hard time with plans, so it's fun to animate these things and just give you a sense of how it might shape up. Okay, trying to build a buffer around this area, make sure it's safe around the, um, the streetcar. You have this kind of flexible space, and it really transitions to a more natural, sheltered landscape as you head up to the Wyandotte Edge. All right. So the second idea is the Eastern Superblock. <laughs> this keeps uh, Baltimore and Maine open and proposes to close Walnut. And so a uh, similar approach. This is instead of having the kind of smaller carve outs, uh, we have larger landscape spaces here. So they could be larger gathering spaces for events or small groups um, that lands at a plaza at the lower level um, that as you're coming down this edge, you could land on top of a, a small park service building and take a pedestrian bridge over so you wouldn't have to cross Baltimore. Um, that has you come, come down near the entry to the playground. Uh, there's a fitness outpost here. There's a small single food and beverage kiosk on this edge. Uh, a games court, some smaller kind of plaza activity. And then we want to make sure, again, we know there's a lot of things happening around this park in Kansas City. We want to make sure that this park is a good neighbor. Um, so we want to make sure it's sized correctly for the kinds of events. You've got the ballroom, you've got Power and Light, you've got T-Mobile. So really, um, we haven't enlarged. The lawn is a little bit bigger here, but it doesn't take over the whole block because those needs are kind of met in other spaces. Um, but it does include uh, an interactive fountain here on the west end. Uh, the dogs are on the north edge here big natural landscape here. So again, those are kind of refuge moments from the city. 
Uh, and again, this is kind of a larger concentrated food and beverage outpost that is about the same size as the other two combined. Uh, still the same, again, because of this location, the proximity to all this activity, we still think that this eastern edge is where we want to have um, all the action and special events. Um, that just really seems to be a, a really, really strong synergy. So this puts the family kind of in the middle of the two refuge blocks. So um, you have a little bit more variety. Instead of having the larger section, there's a little more of this kind of welcoming green area that's kind of more evenly distributed through the project um, with the family moment, the playground here in the center, and again, the park on the edge, and then some notion about this buffer for vegetation, noise, and particulate matter from the freeway. Um, let's see. So the building program, the kind of the really the, the important note here, this is a consolidated area for all the food. And we have this kind of notion of the pedestrian bridge that's connected to the restroom. And there still would be a small food and beverage outpost at the children's area. Um, again, larger kind of landing zones as you come down this walk, bigger opportunities to have inter engagement here. There's a fitness component located near this kind of play and active use zone for the families. And you have a big community plaza. So there are sort of bookends of activity on the Eastern Superblock. Uh, again, same ideas. Um, access will be approached from the, the same strategies and principles. We want to make sure that it's universal as best we can. Um, and again, we are thinking about how do we manage the water? Where does it go? How do we bring nature into this? Um, so for those detail blow-ups here, again, the idea that there's some sort of art moment at the upper level, that there are more larger passive spaces, so there's still gardens, but they can accommodate slightly larger groups. There'd be a park office that's kind of, you could have this walk-up roof on the surface, and then the park is accessed from the bottom. It's where you go in for services or meet with someone who's running the park. The ped bridge that goes over, that carries you to have this really incredible view of the playground and the sport court and fitness area, the small cafe on the edge, and then as you head to the larger block, again, this is kind of the big activity plaza adjacent to the, the entry to the streetcar. Um, still this kind of dog area on the north, closer to the residential towers. Big landscape zone in the middle, kind of a rival plaza as you come up the street. And then major food and beverage destination with the event space and a slightly larger event lawn. And they really spread out this grove area along the edge so there's more places to just lounge and hang out in the shade. So uh, with that, I'll just do the quick fly through here. So while this is, this is really, again, a big opportunity for green space and relaxing that is more proximal to the center of all the activity, um, the kids in the slightly shadier, maybe a little bit more protected section here, and then a, just a slightly different approach to coming up this edge. Um, and we're still working through, again, as you can imagine, uh, making the traverse for the, the cap of the freeway is a little challenging. So we're still trying to work through some of the details of how you get up along this edge. Um, so with that, those are kind of the two kind of basic ideas that we're looking at. Um, as a reminder, if you, if you didn't, if you missed it when Chris said it, um, we've got survey documents here. We've got these forms for you guys to fill out, the comment forms. Um, love to get your feedback. We're going to be hanging out in these stations in the back to talk through if you have any questions. There you also notice that there are post-it notes and pens and markers on the desks. If you want to put your comments on the boards, feel free to do so. Um, we really want to hear what you guys think. And uh, I hope that if you have any other questions, you come up and talk to us afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.